Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us, Lord, for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and dying on the cross for us, Father, that we can have that hope, Lord, we can have the peace of eternity through your Son. Lord, we thank you so much for being able to be here together as a church family and worship you and praise you in one accord. 
Lord, we thank you for the beautiful services we had yesterday for Leanne. And we thank you that she is up there worshiping and praising you today. Watch over us and let this service be a sweet, sweet smell to you, Lord. Watch over Pastor as he comes up and brings uh, your word to us and let our hearts and minds be open to your spirit. Move in us today. And in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand together and sing. Let's put our hands together like this. Come on. Central class on September the 19th. That's from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Child care is provided and a meal will be served. If you'd like to stay for the meal, we'd love to have you guys get to meet you a little bit more. This is open to anybody who would like to come and, and hear about what, what's going on at our church and uh, what we feel like God is, is calling us to do and the vision he's asking us to implement. So that is coming up September the 19th. It's almost September. It's getting crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's getting crazy. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was with my son, and we were, Cindy and I were going to go uh, grab some dinner, but we wanted to not bring him, you know. <laughs> we love him, but we just don't want him around all the time, you know. So we're going to get a babysitter, and so we said, we need to get you a babysitter, and he was shocked because kids are so um, exact with the words. Who would want to sit on babies? <laughs> I said, well, we pay people to sit on you. That's what's going to happen. They're going to come over and sit on you. So, Some other quick announcements real quick. We've got a couple quick things. Number, number two is October the 24th is our Raised to Life baptismal service. And that is going to come up October the 24th. And if you have not been scripturally or biblically baptized, what that means is by immersion. We would love to, we'd be honored 
to share that experience with you. And it is the first step of obedience for the believer. So if you've not had it done, if you've not followed the Lord in, in obedience and baptism, this is the day to do it. It's October the 24th, and it's going to be a big celebration just for you. And so we appreciate that. Lastly, Kids Choir has started back up, and Hotel Noel or Noel Hotel is happening uh, coming up in December. I believe it's the 12th, and this is ages kindergarten through fifth grade every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. If you've got kids or grandkids that you'd like to be a part of that, it's every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, okay? If you have any information on how to sign up, you go to cbc.live, L-I-V-E, C-B-C. I need less enthusiasm from you guys. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Holy smokes. I'm up here. Y'all think this is easy. It ain't easy. cbc.live. Hey. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> about to have revival break out of in this place. And right there on the home page, there's a, a button that says sign up. You, you hit that button and it takes you to all the different events that you can sign up for. And it's simple, painless, clean, and easy. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you. We ask your spirit would guide us that you would be in the middle of this place today. Forgive us for our pride. I pray that uh, we would hear from your, your spirit this morning, that we would obey, that we would humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And we give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and continue to worship this morning.
Hey, Tom. Hey. <laughs> First off, just let me say, I was wondering if maybe, you know, you would... <laughs> Whew. Boy, this is so... Awkward. <laughs> I just need to say it. And so I will say it. Here goes. What I'm trying to say is... Are you using your stapler? Okay, so church goes way back. Don't you just love the intimate details of history? <laughs> hey, Tom. Nothing. What? See you. you. You have things to do, don't you? I'm sorry. I, I can... I'm overwhelming you, aren't I? Are you overwhelmed? I mean, there, uh, there's many different kinds of churches. I didn't even want to talk to the woman. I mean, on and on and on she went. Like, get to the point already. The reformers were mad. Extremely mad. <laughs> All right. Okay. I... I'm sorry. Okay. And I mean, thank you, but... Hey. So then, there he was. Paul Revere. Standing right there. Couldn't believe it. Turns out later it was a costume. I don't know why I'm so nervous. But enough about my therapist. <laughs> I be pushy, aren't I? I, oh, I hate pushy people. I'm sorry. Am I offending you? So I told him, shave your beards. Now. So that's, you know, that's where the church is, but that's, that's far from you, isn't it? Oh, man, and then you'd have to pay for gas. I mean, and gas prices, that's rough. So then they were like, we'll settle Texas. You try and talk to those natives. I mean, I didn't plan, you know, what I was going to, to say to you. I mean, that would be creepy. You know, helpful, but, I mean, creepy. I know, um, you know, probably, you know, what you're thinking, you know, back off, pushy person. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't mean to be pushy. I just, I want to, you know, share with my heart. He's right here. Hey, Tom, you want to come with us to church on Sunday? We'll pick you up. Yeah, that'd be great. He's in.
Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. And as soon as you get there, you stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. Second Peter chapter number one. And let me begin at verse twelve and read through the end of this chapter. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Peter said, I want to remind you of what it means to have precious, God-given faith, and I want you to understand all the precious promises that God has given to us in His Word. I want to remind you of who you are and what you are in Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we know, for we have not followed cunning devised fables when we made known unto you the power 
and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, and there came unto us such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And have also a more sure word of prophecy, or unto you do well that you take heed, as unto a life that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Father, we pray this morning that you would bless your word. May it speak to our hearts, into our life. And Lord, this morning, may you show us all that you have done in us and all that you want to do through us as followers of Jesus Christ. May he be honored in this service through our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In this passage, Peter is preparing to expose the false teachings and the false prophets. But before he does that, he, he wants to express the character of his own ministry so that you'll have a contrast of what a real God-blessed, God-given ministry is all about in comparison to a ministry that is based upon falsehood. He wants us to see what the motivation is, both for ministry and who the motivator is behind the things that are going on in the name of ministry. And as he does this, he's really giving to us a foundation of the kind of ministry that God blesses and that God uses. And in this passage, what Peter does is he gives us four foundations that every ministry is built upon. It makes no difference what kind of ministry it is, whether it's a pulpit ministry, whether it's in a personal evangelistic ministry, whether it's a ministry of missions, whether it's the ministry of music, whether it's the ministry of education, every ministry must be built upon a proper foundation if that ministry is going to be successful and if it's going to be divinely blessed. This morning, if you're sitting in this room, if you're watching via the internet, and you are a Christian... God wants you to remember, He wants you to understand that as a result of becoming a Christian, God gave you a ministry. No matter whose ministry it is, whether it's Paul's ministry, Peter's ministry, the ministry of Jesus Christ, whether it was the ministry of the Old Testament prophecy, or prophets, whether it's your ministry, my ministry, all God-blessed ministries, if they're going to be blessed of God, are based upon four foundations. And every Christian has been given a ministry by Jesus Christ. And I think some of the greatest frustrations in the ranks of Christendom is that too many Christians have a ministry, but they're not even involved in the ministry that God has given them. Over in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul in chapter 2 says, Now thanks be unto God, verse 14, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make of manifest the Savior of our knowledge by every good place. For, un, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that, are, that perish. 
To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. To the other, we are a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. He said every person who God gives salvation, eternal life, he gives them a ministry, and that ministry to those who are perishing, those who are dying, it's a, it, it comes across as a ministry of condemnation. To those who were saved, those who are in Christ, our ministry becomes a, a, a light of encouragement and blessing to them. And he says in chapter 3, verse number 5, not that you and I are sufficient, but our sufficiency is of God. And we also, he hath made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth light. And then he says in verse chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing that we have this ministry, if you are a Christian this morning, if Jesus Christ lives in your life, God saved you for a purpose. He saved you on purpose. And He gave you a ministry. And He said, We have received this ministry. Therefore, do not faint, do not become lax. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. We do not handle the word of God deceitfully, but it by the manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The reason that God fills every believer at the moment of salvation with the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3.16 reminds us that our body is the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in us. And when God saves us, He gives us His Holy Spirit. When God saves a person, according to Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, God gives us a spiritual gift or gifts and every believer is to function in the local New Testament church and exercise that spiritual gift. That's to enhance the body and the work of Jesus Christ upon this earth. Now in this passage, Peter gives four foundations upon which every ministry that God given, that God blesses and uses based upon these foundations. In an effective God blessed ministry, it always begins with the foundation of personal concern. That's what Peter is saying there in chapter, uh, verse number 12, when he said, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet that as long Paul Peter said, as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you into remembrance. Peter's expressing a concern for those to whom he's writing. He cares about them. He wants to stir them up. He wants them to know and to remember and to live based upon the knowledge of everything that's taken place spiritually in their life as a result of coming to Jesus Christ. You, you notice in that 12th verse, he starts out with that word, wherefore. He wants to remind them that all of those Christian graces that he mentioned over in chapter 1 in verses 5 through 8 of those things that we're to add to this eternal salvation that God gave us. Peter has this affectionate eye as a, as a true shepherd of the flock. He cares for them. And church, no ministry is ever going to be successful until, first of all, there is personal concern. Peter wanted to have an effect upon the lives of these to whom he's writing. He has a personal concern about their future walk and their eternal life 
with Jesus Christ. And I, and I think I can say this safely. I think one of the missing dimensions in 21st century Christianity is the dimension of personal love and concern. When people discover that you genuinely love them and concerned or they are concerned for them, they're willing to listen to what you have to say. This world is looking for love. And when they find out that you really love them, they'll be drawn to you. You notice that Peter's appeal to these believers is to keep a sharp focus on what they already know. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to always put you in remembrance of these things. Let me ask you a question. How did you become a Christian? How did you come from death to life? How was it that one time you walked in darkness and today as a child of God, you're walking in the light? How is it that one time you were spiritually dead and today you're alive in Jesus Christ? We need to constantly be in remembrance of what God did in our life when we were saved, when we were born again, when we were removed from that spiritual death and given life. He wants us to remember. And you and I, we need to constantly be going back to the basics. Peter did not want them to forget. Why? Because the devil's chief attack against believers is to keep them from living and practicing what they know they should as a child of God. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, like a roaring light, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to get you off track. You, as a Christian, have a ministry that God has given to you and both of us, you know, most of us, we, we don't really need a lot of new truth. People, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times through the years somebody will say, well, what, what are you going to teach us new today? And my, my usual response is, I don't really have a lot of new things to teach you. I just want to remind you what you already know, but you're not practicing in your life. Because that's what most preaching is. It's not telling you something new. It's just reminding you, you need to start doing what you know you ought to be doing. That's, that's the content of most Bible preaching. You, you, you know, uh, we don't need new truth. We just need to, to get our obedience up to date. That's what Psalm 25 is all about. You ought to, when you get home this afternoon and you've got just a few moments to sit down and relax in the presence of God, read that 25th Psalm. Where basically Paul David is saying this, Lord, teach me to be content to live in the midst of your will and to perform it in our life. Our problem, church, is not knowing God's will. Our problem is doing what we already know we should do. And I think it, that there's two dangers that all of us face as believers. First of all is the danger of forgetfulness. You know, it's the custom of the human heart to be willingly forgetful. I think one of the primary functions of the church and, and, and brothers and sisters in Christ and the reason God puts us together is for us to constantly remind each other of how we're to live the Christian life. We're to encourage each other. We're to engage each other. We're to exhort each other. We are to, we're to live by that, that system of, of drill and repetition. That's what Isaiah chapter 28 verse 10 says. That it is precept upon precept. It is line upon line. Here a little, there a little. You don't learn something by hearing it one time. It must be repeated over and over and over again. And that's why it's so important that when we come to the house of God, whether it's in a Sunday school class, a Bible class, a Bible study, whether it's sitting in the auditorium when the preacher is preaching the Word of God, we ought to if we're be real intentional and take some notes and, and to try to remember what the preacher's saying and what we're being taught in the class. Giving attention 
to the Word of God is vitally important. You go over that 17th chapter of the book of Acts, and there when Paul's speaking about the Berean Christians, notice what Paul says in Acts 17 verse 11. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with readiness of mind, and they went home and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Wherefore, many of them believed. They heard the word of God. They took their notes. And when they got home in quiet and private, they searched those things to see that what the preacher said was true and exact. Concerning Philip's ministry, in Acts chapter 8, it says in verse number 6, And the people, with one accord, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake unto them, seeing the miracles which he had done. Philip preached the word of God. They didn't just hear, they took heed. They gave interest. They invested themselves into what they were hearing from the word of God. Speaking of Paul's first convert in Europe, Lydia, in Acts chapter 16, it said Lydia was a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, and she heard she was a religious woman, and she wanted to know more about God, and her heart was opened, and she attended unto those things which were spoken by Paul. And the result was that her and all of her household were baptized. It gave an affirmation of her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I think the reason so many Christians doubt the Word of God is that they don't give it much attention. We can hear the Word of God, but we don't give it our undivided attention. That's why so many people can come to church and live such defeated Christian lives. In fact, so many Christians can't tell you 10% of what they heard 15 minutes down the road from a service on Sunday. And they can tell you even less percent next Sunday. You, you can tell me 1% of what I said last Sunday. Why? Because we don't give it attention, invest our life into the truth that we heard. The psalmist said in Psalm 119 and verse 11, the problem is we've not hid the word of God in our hearts. And when Satan attacks us, we fall. And the reason I repeat uh, so much of what I say on, on Sunday is because I love you as the people. Amen. One day I'm going to be gone. I would like to think that something in my life and in my years of ministry was a blessing and a benefit and helped you on your spiritual journey. That's the whole purpose of preaching the Word of God, studying the Word of God, trying to lead you in spiritual matters. Why? Because I care about you. I want you to know I love you not just as the people, but I love you spiritually. I'm concerned about you spiritually. In most preaching, as I said a moment ago, is just reminding you of what you already know. You just hadn't put it into practice yet in your life. And so many people come and sit on their sanctified seat in the service, leaving thinking that they've heard enough of the Word of God to last them until next Sunday, and they never study the Word of God throughout the week, and therefore their life is not victorious. Why? Because they've not done that system of teaching of drill and repetition. Drill and repetition. I put a little note down here. Wouldn't it be interesting if each one of us would take just one small New Testament book, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philippians, just four chapters, or even go over there and take Philemon one chapter or Titus three chapters and read it every day for 30 days. We wouldn't forget that chapter and we would begin to make it a practicing principle of spirituality in our life. You know, forgetfully, we forget the reason God saved us. We forget that God has a purpose in redeeming us and God gave us a ministry. 
But not only is there the danger of forgetfulness, but I think the second danger is the danger of familiarity. We don't only fall in the danger of forgetting, we also fall in the danger of an unresponsive familiarity to the Word of God. We hear so much Bible and so much about Jesus Christ and so much about salvation and redemption that for most of us it just doesn't even register anymore. Just doesn't have much of an effect upon us anymore. And as time, as time goes on, those things that at one time excited us, they just become old hat. And they don't get us, they don't arouse us spiritually any longer. And as time goes by, our appreciation of certain divine truths, they just grow dull. And those things that we once cherished in our life, no longer do they interest. Why? We're just too familiar with them. How many of us have really grown cold about our salvation? To how many of us has the, the, the fact that God saved us from a life of sin, it's lost its excitement. We don't even get excited about seeing other people get saved. We become unmovable. We become hard in our hearts. And when we get backslidden from living a tarnished and a life that is in sinful living in disobedience to God, we become so familiar with truth that the preacher can get up and hit us slap dab in the face with our sin and it just doesn't affect us at all. We're like what Paul described to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 verse 2. Our conscience has been seared like a hot iron. Church, the way you avoid that is to become familiar with the context of the Word of God. God presents the same truths over and over and over again, but He always does it in different contexts and in different situations all throughout the Word of God. It's that drill and repetition. Drill and repetition. Why? Because God knows what may not touch your heart in one area might arouse your interest and attention in another. You know, truth can affect our hearts, but it must never be allowed to become so familiar that when we hear something, we say, well, I already know that. I've already done that. I've already practiced that. I used to do that. Christian's heart gets excited when God nails the truth of divine uh, opportunity and activity in our life, and He does it from different aspects in our life. We need, we need to have a personal concern, not just for others, but for our own spiritual life. Notice what Paul or Peter said in verse 15. He said, moreover, I will endeavor, I, I will endeavor, Losing my thought here. That ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Peter's trying to say, I want you, I want you to understand that this precious faith that you have what God has done in your life. I want you to remember that precious faith that you've received. I want you to understand the precious promises of God. I want you to remember uh, the Christian graces in your life that need to be added to your common faith in Jesus Christ. All of those things, he said, are required. And then Peter said his desire was that God would enable him to always bring us to a place of remembrance in our Christian life. And you know, God granted Peter's request. That's why 2,000 years after Peter died upside down on a Roman cross, you and I are reading and studying the words that he said because God said, I'm going to use your words, Peter, to bring to remembrance those things that I've done in each of their lives. Peter wanted to, he wanted us to understand that this thing called Christianity is one of the most important things that we'll ever grasp. And the tragic thing about Christianity today is that it is rooted in the ineffectiveness 
of apathy and forgetfulness. In verse 13, Peter said, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, as long as I'm living in this body, I want to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. You know, all of us ought to, we ought to ask ourselves the question, when is the last time we really took time to prepare our hearts to come to the house of God, to worship God? When is the last time we got up and not just devoted getting our makeup on, our hair combed, and our face shaved, and our, our colognes put on and dressed up in our clothes? We look like? When is the last time that we gave as much spiritual devotion as we do to physical devotion about coming to the house of God? When's the last time that we got up on, in the presence of God and got on our knees and bowed our knees and asked God to prepare us to apply the word of God to our life and allow the spirit of God to make us a worshipful purpose? When is the last time that we really prepared ourselves to come to the house of God so that when we leave a service, we've been stirred by the Spirit of God, we've been motivated by the Word of God, and we leave different people than when we came in to the building. When is the last time that you and I gave that much devotion to come to the house of God? Problem is, and we'll have to all be honest, most of us come with all the wrong reasons and all the wrong motives. If you and I would become prepared to meet God and be challenged by God's Word, I'll tell you, something miraculous would happen to Central Baptist Church. Something miraculous would happen in your family. Something miraculous would happen in your life personally. We need to be stirred up by remembering the truths that established us in the family of God to begin with. There must be personal concern, not just for ourselves, but in the ministry that God gave us. We're to be personally concerned about those to whom God wants us to minister. And the second foundation, I believe, is not just personal concern, but it's personal urgency. Verse 14, knowing, Peter said, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. That word shortly means suddenly. Peter is saying that the Lord revealed to me that, the, his, that, that my death, my departure would not be long. I'm not going to die a long lingering death, but it's going to be a sudden death. Every man who has ever lived has lived with the fear of impending death. Every one of us in this room, you watching on TV this morning or on the internet, you are going to die. We just don't know when. We live with this sense of death. And the apostle Paul lived his life knowing that he was going to soon die. Peter's, he's writing here. He lived with the same urgency. You remember, and I'm not going to take the time, but over in John 21, verses 18 and 19, when Jesus met them there on the Sea of Galilee that morning when they were fishing and, and they had fished together. And he walked off and told Peter, he said, Peter, you're going to die. And you're going to die a martyr's death. Your death is going to be quick. It's going to be similar to the way I've been crucified myself. Your, your, your life is going to come to an abrupt end. Now, get the picture in his mind. When Peter's writing this, he's about 60 years of age. And he knew that if he was going to die a martyr's death, it would be pretty soon. Why? Or else he might die of old age. And before he could die of old age and natural causes, 
He was going to have to be, something was going to have to happen quick. And so he knew that the end of his ministry was at hand. Peter knew that soon he would take off this tabernacle, this tent in which he lived. And the problem I'm afraid with most of us is we're more concerned about the tabernacle than we are with those who live inside the tabernacle. The tabernacle is not important. It's the soul, the eternal soul that lives in that tabernacle because soon we're going to put off this tabernacle. Soon we're going to die. Soon life is going to be over as far as we're concerned. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. Paul said, but to die is gain. He says over in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, number 5 that we know that, that this earthly tabernacle, this house, will be dissolved and we have a building of God not made eternal in the heavens. In verse 8, 2 Corinthians 5, we are confident, I say willing rather, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We are going to cease to exist on this earth. Wherefore, we labor, we strive, we get intentional, whether present or absent, that we may be accepted by Him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive those things done in our body according to all that we have done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Psalm 90 and verse 12. So Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. That passage over in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Solomon said, In all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Whether you're wealthy, whether you're poor, whether you're educated, whether you're ignorant, no matter what the condition of your life, your hand, your life is in the hand of God. And no man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is done before them. All things come alike to all. There's one event to the righteous and one event to the wicked. There's one event to the good. There's one event to the clean. There's one event to the unclean. To him that sacrificeth, and him that sacrificeth not. As it is good, so is the sinner. He that sweareth, as he that sweareth, feareth an oath. There is an evil. This is an evil among all things done under the sun. And there is one event that cometh unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men, full of evil and madness in their heart while they live. And after that, they go down to death. You can be here every time the doors open the church building. You can be the most faithful person in reading the Word of God every day and studying the Word of God. That doesn't change the fact that you're going to die person can live ungodly and, and be the most demented human being on the face of the earth and they're just like, he said, one thing in common, they're all going to die. We're going to one day stand in the presence of God and receive those things done in our body according to all that we have done, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Listen to the intentional words of the psalmist. In Psalm 39 and verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days. What is it that I may know how frail I am? Thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Church, whatever we do for Jesus Christ, 
We need to do it now. There must be an urgency about our life. There must be an urgency about our ministry. Our time is so limited that we must take this drastic sense of urgency if we're going to get the job done, if we're going to complete the purpose for which God saved us, we must do it now. Our life, our life is here and now and all that counts is today. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. Boast not yourself of tomorrow. The psalm of Solomon said, for thou knowest not what one day may bring forth. James said, what is your life? It's like a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. Our time, our life, our ministry is so limited and it should take on a great sense of urgency of accomplishing what God has saved us to accomplish. God will not be honored and blessed with a life that's just lackadaisical. Every day counts. And most Christians I know, they kind of, and I know this sounds crude, they live like a a ding-dong life every day. Watching and attending to those things that just really don't matter. Jesus Christ, they sang about it this morning in, in, with the, in the choir. Jesus Christ is going to come soon. Revelation 3 verse 11, Revelation 22 7, Revelation 22 12. Jesus said, I come quickly. Revelation 22 20, surely he said, I come quickly. And Peter had a keen insight as to why everything that God had called him to do took on an urgency. Why? He said, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in your remembrance. He said, you've got to have an urgency about your life. Why? Because we do not have the promise of tomorrow. Personal experience also is one of those foundations that God blesses. If you're going to have a God-blessed ministry, you must first have those two attitudes, concern and urgency. But then you must add content to what you're doing. We have those two things, experience and knowledge. All four of those things are necessary for a balanced ministry. It does no good to be concerned if you have no content. It does no good to have content if you have no concern. You see, as Peter, but by giving this experience, he moves into the thoughts of the second coming of Christ. Peter's trying to explain his life. <laughs> this ministry, why am I excited? He said, well, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. And Paul Peter said, I've experienced is coming. You say, well, no, Peter couldn't have experienced the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're still waiting for it to happen. And Peter says, no, this thing we're talking about, it's not a fable. It's not a figment of imagination. When you hear people talk about Jesus coming again, that's not just wishful thinking. Are you listening to me, church? The world thinks we absolutely have lost our mind when we talk about Jesus Christ is going to come again. That the trump of God's going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. They think, man, the world thinks we've lost it. But I ask you a question. Do you really believe that Jesus Christ is coming again? Listen to me. Peter said, I have experienced it. And my time's out, but you're going to have to listen for just a minute. Listen over in Matthew chapter 16. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples in verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life uh, for my sake shall find it. What is a man profited? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, and what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in glory of his Father and with his holy angels, and he shall reward every man according to to his works. Listen, verily he said, I say unto you, 
There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Jesus said, there are those standing here who are going to see the coming of Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, that that seems impossible. Preacher, 2,000 years, we've still not seen it. But when you come to chapter 17 of Matthew there, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he took them up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there they saw Jesus Christ transfigured in their very presence. And the description that you have of Jesus in Matthew 17 is the exact same description you have that John Beloved gave in the Revelation chapter 1. And he was, trans, he was transformed in their presence and they saw him. In the transformation, you have Jesus Christ in his glory, not in his humiliation. Peter said, I I saw this and therefore I know it's going to take place. He said, I saw Moses and Moses represented all of the church who died in faith in Jesus Christ. There was Elijah. He represented those who were going to be raptured. There was Peter, there was James, there was John, not yet glorified. They represented physical Israel living in the kingdom. There was the multitude of people at the foot of the mountain. They represented those in the kingdom who will be born in the kingdom, that thousand year millennial reign. And so in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, Peter's saying, I tell you the second coming, I was an eyewitness of it. I have personally experienced that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. And therefore he said to you, I'm sharing with you my experience in Jesus Christ. Church, what experience has God done? What what experiences and things have taken place in your life that God has prepared you that you might effectively minister for Him to other people? Personal experience is what it takes for a God-blessed ministry. And then he said, finally, there's got to be personal knowledge. You, you, You can... Experience a lot of things in life, but if you extract the Word of God from the foundation of what you've experienced, then your experience is nothing but a hollow experience. That's what he says in verse 19. For we have a more sure word of promise. It's one thing. Peter said it was one thing to be on the holy mount of God and see Jesus Christ transformed in my very presence. It was one thing to see Moses and Elijah It was one thing to experience those things. But he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Spirit of God. If you do not, if we do not give ourselves to the study and the practice of the Word of God in our life, our God-saved ministry for which God redeemed us will never have the foundational proof of God. You must have the Word of God in everything that you do. It is the basis by which God works in each of our lives. We must give ourselves a devotion. There must be a personal concern in our hearts for people. The people that are in your life right now are there because God wants you to minister to them. The people you'll meet tomorrow the people you'll need next month. God puts them in your life and you're to have a personal concern for their eternal destiny. But you need to do it with urgency. We have no guarantee we'll be living tomorrow. All we, the promise we have is today and I don't even know that I'll be around at three o'clock this afternoon. I've got today. I've got this moment. There must be personal urgency. Folks, there must be the experience. What has God done in your life? You've never had a heartbreak that wasn't for a reason. You've never had a disappointment but that God didn't want to use it 
for a reason. You've never had a victory in your life that God did. Every experience you've had as a child of God is so that you might share that experience with someone else. And you always equate it to the truth of the Word of God. Yesterday we had this precious service for Leanne and to watch her family, her precious kids get up and talk about their mom. And I, and I sat there thinking, sure, and here, here was a woman who had six children. Here's a woman who had a full-time job and in the midst of being married with six kids went back to school and got her, her degree to, to be able to teach, got her a master's degree. And yet not one of those kids stood on this platform and said, well, I feel like my mama shortchanged me. No, she had time for every one yeah. of her kids. I ask you, how much of our time Amidst our busy schedules, are we investing in the lives of those that God has put into our life? That's the ministry that God's called us to. Please bow your head and close your eyes for just one minute. Are you a Christian? Has Jesus Christ moved into your life? Have you given your life to Christ? If you are a Christian this morning, I repeat again and again and again, God saved you on purpose for a purpose. God has something He wants you to do. And every person in your life, be it family, be it friend, be it foe, are in your life for God to use you to bring them closer to Jesus Christ. We don't have the promise of tomorrow, but we have today. Father, I pray today that you'll help us as we look to these encouraging words of the Apostle Peter, who knew that his end of his life was near, and yet his one desire was to stir up God's people to live the life that God had saved them to live. I pray today, Lord, you'll Help me to have a, a deep, loving concern for those that you've placed in my life. Help me, Lord, to do it with a sense of urgency. And Lord, may I take every experience of my life, those that have been wonderful and those that have shattered and broken my heart, may I take those and apply them to the truth of your word that I might be a blessing and an encouragement to someone else on their Christian journey with Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, today to be drawn close to you and help us, Lord, today to be thankful that you loved us so much that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, that we might be part of your eternal family. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I love you. God bless you. Roy's got something he's got to say, so I'm through. Just real quick, if you're our guest today, we're so glad that you joined us today. We want to invite you to stop by our Connect table out in the lobby. In the seat back in front of you, you'll see a card holder. These cards are there. They're called Connect cards. If you'll take just a moment real quick, uh, request a little information. If you'll just fill that out and stop by our Connect table, we got a guest bag we'd like to give you. Just our way of saying thank you for coming to worship with us. And we're also there to answer any questions that you might have about the fellowship here at Central. Thank you again for being here. God bless and have a wonderful, wonderful week.